Uh, in the spirit of uh, the Adelaide Rotary, Rotary Club of Adelaide, uh, the introduction will be a lot shorter than the speech, so I'll be brief. Uh, John Rao MP, the Honourable John Rao MP, is our Deputy Premier and holds a number of key portfolios, uh, interests in the State of South Australia currently. They're detailed in the, in the bulletin. John uh, is a legal man by background, a passionate uh, believer in certain issues, uh, including, uh, uh, dare I say, cleaning up some anomalies in the real estate and auctioneering area early in his career, and I know that will be of interest to some of the Rotarian real estate agents in our group. John also is Minister for Planning, and I guess those members of the Burnside group who didn't attend the other night to the fellowship will be probably have been rehearsing their questions for John today about development issues in South Australia. But the Deputy has, uh, has kindly offered to speak for a few minutes about overarching general issues of vision for South Australia, and then, I think, uh, gone out on the end of the, uh, of the plank a little uh, to offer himself as a Q&A session for the balance of the meeting. So without any further ado, our Deputy Premier, the Honourable John Rowe. Uh, it's always difficult when you come to uh, a group and uh, you don't know all of the people in the room, you don't know all of their interests and you don't really know how to uh, offer a contribution that will be worthwhile from the point of view of those listening. So for that reason I thought I'd say uh, a mercifully few things to start off with and allow you uh, as the people in the room to determine where things go from there. Um, Something I thought I would talk in general terms about very briefly is the, the issue of um, the vision for the state, but more particularly the vision for the city of Adelaide. There's just a few little facts that I think are worth uh, throwing out there for people to ponder. Um, first one is no state government, and certainly no state government minister, has control over how many people enter this country from overseas, uh, how many people move from one state to another once they're here, and uh, how many children people have. Uh, now, that means that any debate about population uh, is perhaps interesting, at a national level, because perhaps at a national level at least one of those elements can be dealt with, at least in theory. Uh, but in reality, at a statement, population debates, other than a calculation of population pressures according to the best available information, and planning to deal with those, is about all you can sensibly do. And I have found it quite frustrating that at times when I've been talking to people about our plans for the city over the next 20 or 30 years, I get confronted with an argument about we want zero population growth. And I try to explain to them that, that I'm not the Almighty and I'm not part of the Almighty's government and none of us have the capacity to deliver that. So that's, that's a debate I think it's worth just cold a second and, and it, just move on from that because we can't do anything about it. The demographers tell us that in the next 30 years, if the existing trends continue, and given whatever there is statistically built in there for, for variability, we could be looking at as many as half a million additional people in Adelaide. Now, that raises a number of questions. The most obvious one is where we're going to put them. And planning for this is not wasted, because if it's only 200,000 extra, then you don't have to implement all of your plan. If it's only 300,000 extra, you don't have to implement all of your plan. But if you've got no plan, and you wind up with 200, 300, or 500, you're in serious trouble. What would, would happen if we went into this future with no plan at all, is that we would have more of the same, which would be an ad hoc random growth of the city by way of Greenfields development. That would mean probably at the end we would have a city that began, began somewhere near Port Wakefield 
and ended somewhere near Victor Harbour. And it would basically be on two sides of a very, very long road. And the, the cost to the community in terms of infrastructure, in terms of social isolation of people at the extreme ends of that, in terms of provision of services, in terms of public transport, etc., would be horrendous. Not to mention the impact on prime agricultural land, which would be completely consumed by that, that growth. So that is unacceptable. That is why we have what, what sits there as a 30-year plan. It's a strategic document. It's not, it's not a paint-by-numbers um, uh, manual. It's a strategic document. But it does set out a general plan. And the general plan is this. We need to increasingly fit more of our growth within our current footprint and less of our growth by way of Greenfields expansion and on the fringe. Fairly simple proposition and I would have thought self-evidently sensible. In order to bolster that up, we have put some measures in place very quickly. We passed legislation in the last six months which says the McLaren Vale region is now protected from urban subdivision, so that this, the southward march of the city is being halted at Seaford. In the north east, we have put in the Barossa protection zone, which means once you get to the edge of Gawler, you are at the edge of suburbia, and it will not spill into the Cockatoo Valley and through, through uh, the Barossa Valley. So those two areas, if you like, book, book in the city. We've got the hills uh, face zone to the east, and we've got the ocean, or the gulf to the west. That really says that there are some opportunities for greenfield development over the next 30 years, and those are largely in the north areas like Virginia, Two Wells, etc. And there are going to be increasing requirements for us to find ways to accommodate people within the existing footprint. That is why we have been looking at things like the rezoning of the City of Adelaide, which we have done largely in a cooperative way with the Adelaide City Council. That is now complete. Since March last year, when that was done, we have under case management or through the case management process, 1.2 billion approximately of projects for the City of Adelaide, which is not bad. Uh, we have now entered into a process of consultation on the inner rim council. So these are the ones on the other side of the parklands. Discussions with them have been going on for 18 months, in spite of what you might have heard from at least one council, or should I say only one council. Uh, and those discussions have been going on for about 18 months. As a result of those, there are conversations taking place to finalise those development plans which will provide some areas of uplift, for example, on the, the periphery of the parklands. The trade-off for that is the character suburbs which lie behind that are going to be protected from two-for-one uh, infill, battle axe blocks, the replacement of the magnificent um, 19th century villa with the two for one Tuscan something. That's the trade off. In addition to that, we are trying to make the city a much more interesting place and to take advantage of the creativity that we have in the city, which we are, we are hoping <coughs> will generate a virtuous circle where people not only want to be here, they don't want to go to Melbourne when they're young, they don't want to go to Sydney, they're happy to stay here, but they want to live in the city as well. Because we have to actually change people's views about. City living is something that we, we in Adelaide have not really appreciated as people in European cities have understood for, for centuries, really. And the other thing, of course, is that we need to uh, impress upon people that it, this is a safe place, it is an interesting place, it's a very livable place for people. And we have to make the most uh, of what the city can be. So, over the next few years, uh, I expect to see Adelaide become a more interesting place. At the moment there are 22,000 people who live in the city of Adelaide, which is about half of what it was in 1912. I would have thought a reasonable aspiration would be in the next five to ten years we got back to where we were in 1912. And I would like to see us overshoot that by another 30, 40 or 50,000 perhaps in the next 30 years beyond that, or 20 years beyond that. I mean, how can you have a very vibrant, interesting city if there's, if there's nobody living in it? If it's just husky, empty, vacant space uh, for many hours of the day and people commute in and commute out with all the transport chaos that that sort of uh, conjures up. So anyway, I realise that's a very sort of uh, 
very much a panoramic run through of where we are, but I, I'm happy to answer any question about any of that or indeed um, anything else if I, if I know the answer. If I don't, I'll say I don't. Uh, and, um, you know, I think it's really important that everybody in Adelaide starts stepping up to this plate. <coughs> the people, our architects need to start thinking about being more creative than just building single story brick veneer places that go on forever. Our engineers need to start thinking about the, the, conquering some of the problems which make the economics of four or five story buildings much more complicated than the economics of a two story building. We, we need to have uh, our, our councils around the place be a little bit more creative about where these places can be clustered so that they actually deliver quality living environments and opportunities. Uh, our development industry has to actually say, look, we've now passed out of the sort of Wild West, um, endless expanse type uh, development. We're moving now into a more sophisticated, nuanced system where development will occur in regions to complement those regions and fit in with their existing character and uh, quality. I was a little bit late today because I was actually at the opening of uh, Bank Street. Uh, now Bank Street, uh, I'm sure you all know, is that rather uh, unprepossessing stretch of bitumen between North Terrace and Hindley Street. It pops out roughly on the other side of Lee Street. Uh, if you haven't had a look at it lately, go and have a look please soon. Because it's just an example of what we've been able to do with a bit of imagination, a bit of money, and total cooperation from the owners of property and the owners of business in that street. And um, this afternoon's a good time. There's, there's jazz bands down there, there's sausages being cooked, and uh, it's, a, it's a quite a good atmosphere. And I think anyone going down there would agree that that street is now a much more interesting place than it ever was before. Well, I see that sort of thing rolling out all over the city, but it's not going to roll out in the sense that we've got this sort of one-size-fits-all outcome that we drop into every street. The Bank Street outcome is totally different from Lee Street, as it should be. And what's going to happen in due course in Topham Street and Bentham Street and Twin Street and all these other places, Peel Street, is going to be organic. It's going to come out of what that street is, the people in that street, their business, uh, how they feel about it. But these places can come alive and can make the city more interesting. So. Um, I know it's a big plug for Bank Street, but I really like it. I've been driving my staff crazy. I've been going down there two or three times a day uh, for the last past week or two. It's just such an interesting thing to see this transform over literally a week. Anyway, thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I'm happy to take any questions. Over to you, Rogerians. Any questions for the Deputy? Ivan Morris. Yeah, good, good question. Um, the 30 year plan is predicated on st statisticians material which says that we're looking at maybe 500,000 over the next 30 years. Now, um, like all predictions, I guess it's, uh, it's not a, a fact, it's a prediction. But if that is correct, then obviously, as I said, we have to plan for it. But I accept we may under or overshoot that for any number of reasons. Um, you know, if, if um, if we discovered um, the biggest oil field in the world or something um, very shortly, there might be a lot of people wanting to migrate to South Australia from around the country. Our population could swell quite quickly. <coughs> so obviously there are unknown things about it. You ask what will those people do? That's a good question. I think w there is no doubt that a greater population has to be serviced by service industries of all different kinds. So there's, a, there's an element there of the population in itself sustaining itself in terms of work. But we do have to keep thinking about where we're going to find opportunities for advanced manufacturing, where we're going to find opportunities to build on our existing defence uh, industries here, where we can actually make more value-add type uh, 
work occur in South Australia for the agriculture and primary industry sections of, of the community. Uh, look, South Australia has never ever had it easy. Right? As all of you probably know, the state was just about to disappear down the plug hole when we found some copper in uh, uh, you know, Burra and Kapunda and over there on the moons of the uh, You know, we, we've got very... We, 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 it's always been a marginal proposition in the sense that it's been hard work. It's not, it's not like uh, some other parts of Australia where all you have to do is sort of get up in the morning and lunch falls out of a tree and you just sit there and you know, amuse yourself. I remember somebody telling me years ago about, I asked a question when I was in Fiji, why is it that um, uh, you have uh, this mixture of population here? Historically, how did this happen? And it was explained to me, that I think, uh, by a person who was neither uh, Indian or, or Fijian, that when, when the British first decided it would be a good idea to, to grow, uh, produce sugar, they couldn't persuade the native inhabitants that it was more interesting to we were a machete in, in uh, hot, uh, humid conditions all day for months and get paid virtually nothing for it. They couldn't persuade them that that was more attractive than sitting down waiting for lunch to fall out of a tree and go fishing. And, and so, I mean, there are parts of Australia where, where people have had it pretty easy for a whole bunch of reasons. I'm not being critical of them, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just saying we've always had it tough. We just have to, we just have to work harder, be smarter, but historically, we have done that. We have we have met that, that challenge. I'm confident we'll be able to in the future. Another one on your left. Uh, Premier, um, 500,000, following on this, uh, this uh, subject of 500,000 new people, and uh, where might they obtain jobs? Um, the state government at the moment uh, seem to have a few problems with, uh, I, I might quote a couple of people, with um, outsourcing work to China. Uh, in particular, the uh, the uh, the overpass on the on South Road. Much of that work has been outsourced to Chinese companies. The 500,000 people that we're actually going to have, where are they going to work if we uh, we as a uh, as a uh, a responsible government outsource much of this work to uh, overseas countries? And that's really the question: is uh, what what is this government going to do? Uh, the, the, and certainly, the jobs may be cheaper, uh, and the work may be cheaper. Um, that, that is being outsourced overseas. But of course, when the work isn't done properly and you've got to send it back again, uh, then their work could certainly have been done inside, uh, inside our own state border at a much cheaper cost. Is the government looking at this program? I understand there's been some comment on the radio recently that you are looking at it, but what are we going to do to try to guarantee the jobs of South Australian workers? Okay, but that, <coughs> that's a good question. It really operates at, at two levels, actually. Um, <coughs> at one level, we're talking about competition with overseas people. At another level, we're talking about competition with people in other states, because that's often raised as well. Why, why, you know, why don't you use Adelaide-based companies to do everything? Uh, now, to deal with the second point first, many years ago, uh, there was a, a meeting of very wise people in Canberra, as there often is. And um, at, at this meeting, they agreed to, to sign up for a thing where they agreed that there was going to be a thing called competitive neutrality around, around Australia. Now, the, the, the concept was basically this. If you allow every state to give preference to its own workforce or its own company <coughs> bus, then that's exactly what they would do. And it would mean you would have a lack of competitive pressure on those companies because they've got a guaranteed market for their product. And you wouldn't get the best innovation, you wouldn't get the best price, and it wouldn't actually drive um, creativity and, and innovation. That was the theory. For South Australia, actually, that theory is even more important because we're only 6 or 7% of the population. If we lock our companies up here and say, you're all protected, but New South Wales gets to do the same, Queensland gets to do the same, etc. We're locking up 6% of the market for our people and losing the other 94. It actually, in theory, suits us much better to have a competitive neutrality position because instead of us being, our companies being locked into a 6% market share, which we've got with little competition and no access to the rest, we've got access to the lot. So, 
at a national level, that's, that's really the way that, that game plays out. At an international level, it gets infinitely more complicated because it depends whether you're talking about moving uh, um, labour around the place, which brings you straight into the Commonwealth uh, regime with those four, five, seven visas and all those other complicated issues there, which are something we get consulted about but we have no control over. Um, if you're talking about buying prefabricated equipment or pre prefabricated parts from overseas, then there, there, no doubt there are issues there, but I mean, then you're moving again into this Commonwealth era about free trade and uh, everything, which is uh, an argument I'm sure we could all spend a long time on. Uh, if you're talking about companies which have a foreign head office uh, being allowed to compete within Australia, at some point or other, you still get back to this question about do, are they adding something into the competitive mix which is for the greater good of the whole, the whole place. Now, I don't know the answer to that in any particular instance. And I'm sure that there's capabilities for some of these companies from some places overseas to, to in, in effect, have an uncompetitive advantage. I'll, I'll just give you one example which, which is, <coughs> strikes me from my own experience here. When I was Minister for Tourism, I used to speak to the people from the Convention Centre uh, and uh, such like. And they used to tell me how they were going with bids for international conferences here in Adelaide. And we, we have been doing very well, given our size, in terms of attracting these, these conferences here to South Australia. There was one particular conference we were very keen on, on dealing with, and as was normally the case, the conference organisers are looking three, four or five years out. These, they had come to Adelaide, uh, they had been uh, taken around and shown the facilities and um, I guess uh, given a big hug by the... Uh, the people at the Convention Bureau. Uh, and in the end, what happened is we didn't get that particular job. And what the Convention Bureau told me was, we didn't get the job, not because the people who came here didn't think we were offering the best uh, product, and not even because the price at which we were prepared to offer the product was not competitive. But that another player in the game offered a reasonably comparable product, but a government airline from that country guaranteed to fly everybody to and from the conference for nothing. Which made their bid really competitive. <laughs> so, you know, there's all sorts of funny things go on, but Incredibly complicated, and I think you need to, to deal with each particular individual case in, in its own terms because it, it's enormous variation. I think we've got time for one last quick question and brief answer from uh, David. Yes, uh, Mr. Rao. Uh, yeah, within my children's lifetime, the world population will go from about 6.5 billion to 9.5 billion. Australia's population will go from about 22 million probably 35 or 36 million. South Australia's population will go from about 1.5 to 2.2, 2.3. Probably even more with the overflows from other countries at an unchecked uh, boat provider. The, um, in, in every respect of daily life here in, in South Australia, everything will have to increase by 50%, whether it's farms or schools or hospitals or roads or whatever. <coughs> that has to be funded somehow. On radio earlier this week, the fellow who lived in, lived in Adelaide and has lived in Hong Kong was advocating the building of two 45-storey buildings at Semaphore to, to uh, duplicate, if you like, or sh show how it could be done as it is done in Hong Kong. Is it the government's view that a two-child family will live on the 41st floor of a block of building a block of flats or apartments at Semaphore as the ideal way to live in 20, 30 years' time. Well, <laughs> and it wasn't from Burnside. <laughs> and, and I do have enough time to answer this on one more from Sir Eric. Look, thanks for that question. Look, the, the good bit about that, well, actually, it was all good, really, wasn't it? But it was good in the beginning. You actually are uh, actually putting better than I had the, the scale of the problem. 
the, or the potential scale of the issue, put it that way. I think it's very important. The second thing is um, uh, Adelaide is, is never going to be Hong Kong or Kowloon or anything of that nature. It's never going to be Manhattan, nor should it be. I mean, my perfect, um, my perfect vision, I guess, for what Adelaide would be like would be more like um, uh, Berlin or uh, Stockholm or um, you know something of that scale. So we're not we're not talking you know the, the, the just the sea of skyscrapers up and down the, the streets. We're talking about large sections of the, the city, and I'm talking the inner city. I don't mean all the suburbs. Let me be very clear about that. The inner city. You know, four, five, six storey the norm, which is, I think, on a very human scale uh, and easy to comprehend. Sure, there would be some places where the market would demand a product which might be a high rise product, but that would have to be right there in the CBD area of the city, not um, certainly down the semaphore. I think that's, that's uh, yeah, that, that's not within my radar. And, and, and then areas like, for example, where Coca Cola is here on. Um, Port Road, where you've got the tram running through the front there. I mean, what a waste that we've got. No, no disrespect to Coca Cola, but what, what, what a waste of prime land opposite the, the, the parklands where you've got the tram in front of you, uh, you've got uh, the entertainment centre around the corner, you've got the Clipsal development next door, and we, we, we've got a brewery, a, a, a soft drink bottling concern, a couple of car yards, and a place called Total Tool. I think I quite read what they do there. Didn't you? Um, so I, I, uh, I don't see that as being the up. I, I see there being sensible identification of precincts such as those roads across from the parklands or uh, areas where you are maybe um, with a major train station, say somewhere like Norlunga, they're talking to me about it. They're saying, well, we have a Norlunga centre, we could tolerate four or five storey buildings here somewhere and absorb some more people. We're not talking about, you know, well, I'm certainly not talking about that. And, and it's why I've become a little bit um, fascinated when I read the letters to the editor about apparently what I've got in mind. I, 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 I read them and I think, that's funny, I've never thought of that. But, <laughs> but, uh, and, and I get criticised, first of all, for thinking of something that I haven't thought of, and secondly, for having failed to consult in the circumstances where we are still in the statutory consultation period. Mm. Remarkable. Sadly, sir, the, the Honourable Member's time has expired. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's customary on these occasions to present honoured guests, and we are honoured to have the Deputy Premier of the State and a senior Cabinet member uh, to, to attend Rotary, uh, we believe the finest Rotary Club in Australia. It's customary to give you a fine pen a Mont Blanc or something similar. Sadly, Tony Pilkington raced off to Sydney with all of those. So I hope you accept this, uh, this gesture for all those things that you have to sign in the future uh, on the thanks and the very heartfelt thanks of the Adelaide Rotary Club. Thank you very much.